Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hi everybody, welcome to Brass Chats. Today we're hanging out with Denver Dill. He's a past winner of the National Trumpet Competition. He is a performer and clinician at the International Trumpet Guild Conference, and he is a member of the world famous and historic Hellcats at West Point. Denver, great to see you. Thanks for hanging out hey, with us today. Hey, uh, It's great. We're happy to be here. West Point's beautiful. It's a nice, nice day. It is an unbelievable place yeah. to be. It really is. It is. That was the first thing I, I fell in love with was the scenery when I when I came into West Point. So that was that was great. All right, let's get right down to uh, brass tacks right at the beginnings. Do you remember the first day you ever had a trumpet, or the first time you ever touched or picked up a trumpet? I absolutely do. It sticks with me. I think about it all the time. I used to play saxophone in fifth grade because you know that was what the girls liked, or I thought. Yeah. Uh, that didn't pan out so well, and the band director said, "Hey, we need more trumpets." And I thought, well, that's the cool thing with the long slide. So I sent my mom straight to the music store, and she came back home, brought me this short thing with valves, and then I blew into it, and no noise came out whatsoever. And so it was instantly a hate, love-hate relationship with the trumpet. Sure. So, in your early musical life, what kind of stuff did you like playing? Was it? I mean, mine was nursery rhymes, for instance, but you know. The very first tune I remember memorizing was "Bill Bailey, Won't You Please Come Home," and okay. uh, still love that one. It's a classic. But after that, it was it was all. Doc Severinsen and John Faddis and, you know, all sorts of impressive trumpet players. Straight to legitimate and impressive trumpet players. Yep. I don't think I knew what a trumpet was supposed to sound like until halfway through college. Oh, a band director gave me a, a cassette tape of Maurice Andre playing the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, and I used to use that to fall asleep to every night. <laughs> it ended up sticking, though, and then maybe about uh, senior year of high school, you thought, oh, hey, I know this song already. It was in your head somewhere, and then you had a new appreciation for it. Yeah. So... Around what time in your trumpet career would you say you started kind of knowing how to play the trumpet, really? I do think it changes still to this day, and uh, I don't mean that to be coy. I really think that every step along the way, I thought I knew what I was doing. And so I was giving it my best and enjoying the struggle and enjoying each step along the way. So even when I was in eighth grade and I learned my first solo piece for solo and ensemble, I thought I knew what I was doing. It turns out I was horrible the trumpet teacher I had at the time, I was the only student ever that he was going to tell to quit because I was so abysmal. Uh, but he didn't have the nerve to because we're family, and I eventually turned his, changed his tune. But yeah, I always thought along the way, I thought I knew what I was doing, but then you learn something else and you're like, ah, oh, I'm an idiot. I had no idea. What about your official trumpet uh, teachers? So you, you obviously studied in college. You went to EKU, right, in yes. Kentucky? Mm -hmm. and you studied with uh, DiMartino? Right? I had several teachers. My first one was Kevin Eisensmith. He's now okay. at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was uh, Jonathan Martin. He's down in Louisiana. I studied with Vince DiMartino and had some lessons with Terry Everson because they were both around there too. Uh, my foremost teacher, though, at my undergrad was actually a violin teacher. And his name's William Goodwin, and he's down in Florida as a freelancer. And uh, William and I, we, he just gave me unlimited access because he was just so happy to have a student very hungry to learn. He gave me a key to his office, and I would come in usually at 5.30 in the morning and get in you know, as much practice as I could, and we really rebuilt all the technique from a violinist perspective. And uh, that was the most helpful thing. I had a very unorthodox embouchure at the time, and it helped us overcome some of those hurdles. That's amazing. And then the Masters was, I studied with the whole crew at Juilliard, so yeah. uh, Ray Mays, Mark Gold, and Bill Smith. It was really good. And then after that, Dr. Work with Jim Thompson. And... Uh, can't say enough about Doug Prosser also uh, getting the sub with the Rochester Philharmonic and things. Just listening to that guy's sound, that's a lesson in itself. Yeah, so your pedigree teaching-wise is, is, is right up there with anybody uh, alive today, I would say. What do you think, uh, can you share any crazy stories about any of those teachers or a crazy thing that one of them said to you or something like that? Here, here's an interesting story. I found that the, the best teachers, the ones that have been the most influential, have really made their time available to me in generous portions and so I think there's a character of true nurturing and loving that a good teacher has to have and I've always found that to be amazing I, I remember paying one of my teachers in lunches if I bought him a lunch he would give me a lesson uh, another you think about what's a lesson and you know I need to learn this I got to learn this metronome marking and all that I learned so much more by going to them to their jobs and sitting in and not saying anything and being told don't say anything don't do anything don't touch anybody and just watching them at work that was the most telling lessons I could have ever had and uh, I still think about those times like that's what I'm always using on my day-to-day 
job here at West. Excellent. I totally agree about the nurturing thing. I, I'll never forget Phil Collins was my teacher at CCM. Uh, one of them, Alan Siebert, also. We it's split time, but I remember one day I had a really horrible lesson. Just I was really down about it, and and Phil came back and and sent me like a. I don't know, 1,500 word email, just mm -hmm. highlighting the things from the lesson, and it was just so encouraging, just the fact that somebody was that into it. Um, so that's that's good to hear. It's good to reinforce that uh, for me because it's it's totally totally resonates. Yeah, it is. There's a, I think there's a level of just general professionalism that when you love the craft and you see somebody else who has that same drive, that's enough to motivate you and energy and all the caffeine you need. Yeah, that's right. Sustaining a feedback loop there. All right, so you played all over the world. Where did you find the warmest reception? Are there any particular concerts that were memorable because of that? Um, I think gauging audience versus personal feedback, it, I think they are two different things, and you have to be cognizant of that. So sometimes, you know, I, I, I played, and if everybody's been on their feet, or it's been something remorseful where everybody's been weeping, and, you know, you take that as a sign of a job well done. And then there's other ones where you have some sort of personal challenge that you've placed up on yourself. So I'm going to play this piece at this venue in this high pressure situation and pull it off. So there's not one in particular, but along the way you set different benchmarks. And so if it's reaching people and you see them moved by what you're doing, whether it could be cries, you know, tears, it could be cheers, it could be anything, then you've, you've hit the mark. And then there's the personal, I want to do this, I want to have achieved that, the Mount Everest, which I think is a default for most students. If you hit that, ah, I played that piece at this place, check, you know, and you, you cross it off and you look for the next mountain to start climbing and keep going. Sure. Uh, let's get into the nuts and bolts of uh, trumpet playing, if you, if you don't mind. To you, what is the most underrated or underpracticed part of trumpet playing for everybody? If you had to pick one thing that everybody ignores. Relating to the audience. I think bridging that gap between being on stage and the audience having a personal experience with you on stage. That's the probably the hardest thing to teach and probably the most under-practiced thing. How can you practice something like that? I think you have to do it. I think you have to make a conscious decision to be like, I'm going to move you and look them, look them in the eye, seek them out, much as a, a, a speaker would or a comedian or anything else. You said that's your challenge. You change that benchmark and say, that person in the back. I remember one lesson, uh, lesson with Ray Mays, a uh, janitor knocked on the door, and he came in and was, you know, tidying up the room uh, at Juilliard. And when he left, Mr. Mays said, you know, if you can get that guy to stop and listen to what you're playing, you're playing effectively. And he's right. And that is now the new benchmark for how it's going. It's, am I really connecting with them? Because you listen to all the, listen to the great trumpet players. What is a great trumpet player? Think of all the different tones and all the different interpretations of, let's say, classical literature or even jazz. They're wildly different. You know, if you listen to Hertha's sound and you compare that with some of the modern day trumpeters, I don't know that you could win a job with that sound, even though it's a sound that has informed how we all play trumpet and will for generations. So what is the magic moment? The magic moment is more than just each individual technique. It's how they come together through a performer to create an event for the listener. Who was the first, what was the first time you really had that experience where you connected with somebody? John Faddis. John Faddis, I uh, grew up in Ohio and he would, he would come frequently to Columbus and we would see him and uh, I mean it was raw power on the trumpet but there was something more than that. It was like a charismatic sound and a stage presence. He looked like he was enjoying himself and it was, it was almost like a sporting event. It would just, it would fire it up and like, boom, and I'm, oh yeah, you know, you, you just want to fist bump or spike your trumpet, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> get it, you know, it was just completely impressive at the time. And then being in high school, you would hear drum corps and you would feel the same way. And then that evolved until you would hear some supremely delicate playing like Reinhold Friedrich or something else and you'd be like, I can't even imagine how you can just so lightly touch that note and back away and sounds like a string instrument or Sergei Nikarikov now. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Did you ever do DCI or marching band or anything like that? We did marching band in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do any, any more marching after that. I had a very precarious embouchure and marching band seemed exacerbated. So continuing with the nuts and bolts of trumpet, how about a snapshot of kind of your daily warm up or your daily routine or something like that? Um, I try to vary it but I keep the elements of what I'm doing pretty consistent, which is I'm looking for responsiveness. So I will do anything, but typically I just want a little bit of air to give me maximum bang for my buck. So as soon as I can go 
with a whisper of air and it speaks, I know that they're vibrating freely and I'm not making that happen. I'm not clenching down. I'm not introducing all sorts of tension that's not necessary. And then once I have that, I just expand the range and what I'm asking it to do until I feel like I have command of what's needed for that day or what I'm shooting for with some goals. How long a day do you think that takes to, to get that going? Not very long. Uh, considerably less than it used to, so maybe five minutes or less. It's At that point, it becomes mainly mental, sure. and you're just double-checking. Yeah, I've got that. I don't have that. Or you're evaluating, ah, that's a little off, so I'll add that later to my practice session and things like that. But the warm-up seems to be very quick now. So not to get too number-oriented or, or quantified, but how many, on an average day, how many hours do you think the horn's on your face or you're sitting down playing trumpet? Sitting down and playing, it's, it's probably a lot. I don't know. It would vary, but three to five. It's, three to it's five. Maybe it, there's probably days where it's more and probably days where it's less. Um, but it just depends on what the professional demands are, in, uh, currently and then coming up that I'm getting ready for. Sure. All right. So a slightly different question than before uh, regarding what uh, um, what's underrated or under practice. Uh, what do you think is the most misunderstood aspect of, of trumpet playing? Like even maybe necessarily to the to the average Joe, average Jane. Ah. Uh, Trump um, range, upper range, and there's a lot written about it and a lot done. I don't understand why it's so elusive or so rewarded. I have no idea. It's not something I understand even slightly. Though it called to me as a young, you know, trumpet player, it, it doesn't seem that difficult to figure out. Just very systematically saying, what if, what if, what if, and then you'll f you'll figure out your way. So that is the part that I feel like gets the most investments, like golfers. They're always driving. That's cool, but that's one shot. You know, you have the whole rest of the hole to play before you get there. Long drives. I know nothing about focusing on <laughs> long drives at all. Nothing, nothing <laughs> at all. Uh, how do you deal with performance uh, and audition anxiety when that crops up or stage fright or anything like that? Uh, I haven't really had to deal with it as much as some of my friends have. Uh, and I think it's because of how I approach it. I don't approach it as a competition. I've never, ever felt like I've competed with anybody. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. And I've also never felt like I had anything to apologize for. Uh, if it's a piece of music or an excerpt or something, I just think, well, here's how I play this. And if you don't like the interpretation, that's cool. And so that's just very empowering. You are know, like, oh, well, I wish you liked it, but I gave it a lot of thought, and this is how I'm trying to do it, you know? You got any suggestions? So I've never, very rarely have I ever felt uh, nervous on stage. And when I have felt nervous, it's... um. It's shocking and kind of funny, you know, like, oh, wow, that's weird. You know, you got that little bit of quiver in your sound. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I hope that goes away. Yeah, it went away. And then, you, you know, you get lost in the piece. But, right. Yeah. So you just let, the, let the, the work that you've done kind of carry you forward. Yeah, and you just think you're sort of a messenger for the music. And so I don't feel like the responsibility is mine. The responsibility was the composer's. Now I'm interpreting it, and today it's going to sound like this, and this is all I got. <laughs> All right. How many auditions did you take before your uh, successful audition at, at West Point? This was my first audition. I hate you. <laughs> and I hate you too, Chris. Uh, Chris is our young uh, colleague there. His first audition was Coast Guard Band. And, yeah. Uh, all right. How about your physical regimen outside of the trumpet? Exercise? Uh, do you work out consistently? Do you find that that affects your playing? Anything like that? Um, I did. I took up ultra running a couple of years back. Uh, so I ran. To New York City from here a couple times and things like that uh, but I didn't have kids at the time so I've gradually become less ultra and I still run I already ran an hour this morning and that's that's a pretty much a daily that's thing well that's yeah <laughs> it, it sounds like that's it after what you used to do but um juggling family life with that uh, with the professional life you really have to schedule your day and so it's like it's an hour of running um, I did do weightlifting for a while and got really big and that looked weird and so it was like okay so now I'm searching for the new me this is just like trumpet playing where you say oh well I think I'm doing the right thing and you know, go from there but uh, the only thing I've noticed as far as that is if I when I was weightlifting I felt like I had more tension in my back so I would you know kind of squeeze when I was blowing hard and then when running I can be really dehydrated and so if I run and then play the trumpet it seems a little bit less responsive, but if I just drink a lot of water, it comes back pretty quickly. Just something to be thoughtful of. Sure. How about audition preparation? you have any uh, tips, tricks, routines, preparation strategies you can kind of throw out there to the world? No, but i got a good story. I'm so in, in my uh, West Point audition, the, the first audition I took, 
I thought I was pretty confident, not that I would win, but that like I was going to have a good time because I had been up here before and I knew some of the guys and I was like, oh, it's a beautiful place. So I went to uh, Borders Bookstore and I found a DVD of how to play trumpet and I bought it. And I, uh, <laughs> I wanted to buy a box for my trumpet that they sell at uh, Sam's Club, but I you know, didn't. So I got this DVD and I put it on the stand during my audition. So just there was the music, the DVD of how to play trumpet and the proctor just looking at it. And just told, the case. Oh, I was in there. It was just standing there, yeah, and just <laughs> disbelief. Like, I can't believe you're doing that. And in retrospect, I can't believe I did that either, but it probably had a calming effect. You know, just you're making jokes even at your audition. Keeping it lighthearted. Yep. Awesome. So you had the same approach uh, when you did things like NTC or an ITG performance or anything like that? The, um, the competitions I did in college, I did on a very uh, non-competitive reason. The very first competition I did was the Maurice Andre trumpet competition in Paris, France. And I did it because I had wanted to play the Peter Maxwell Davies Sonata. I had wanted it like real bad. And I had a, a MIDI accompaniment that Terry Everson had given me that so I could practice with that, but I didn't have a pianist who was willing to you know, put in the time to learn the piano part. And so I saw this list and that was on there and I said, if you get into this competition, you'll get to play this piece. That was my whole motivation for going, that was the first competition I did. And after that, it sort of became the same thing. Uh, I just thought of a new piece I wanted to play. Hey, there's a competition. Well, cool, because if you advance, usually they'll pay for it. So it was just a, a venue or a means to get to play the literature I wanted to play. That's great. That's good motivation. Kind of pick a deadline and it sort of forces you to work it up by a deadline too instead of just I'll get to that later. Well, and it takes out the competitive element because I'm not worried about anybody else there. I just wanted to play this piece, you know? And yeah. uh, I remember the first rehearsal, I, I nearly cried. You know, and it's not a uh, tearful piece, the Maxwell Davies Sonata. <laughs> but I was just so excited that the pianist, her name was Jan Kingdom, was just knocking it down on piano. I was like, I just want to listen to you play. It was so cool. All right, let's move on to the in injury just for, a, just for a minute. One thing that makes you distinct from most other pro players out there is that you sustained a severe injury. Uh, you rebuilt and you recovered stronger than ever, most people would say. Uh, you chronicled that experience in a book, and that's titled Still Playing, My Journey Through Embouchure Surgery and Rehabilitation. That's available to all you folks at home at www.denverdill.com, which is, last name is D-I-L-L, -L, Denver Dill. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that whole experience with, with the injury? Just anything that, that comes, comes to mind about it. Um, it was great. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, it, every, every other minute you might say the opposite, it's horrible, but all of all the difficulties you experience help help you grow if you're a type of growing person and that's all you can do so very thankful to have had all of to have had the surgery to have had the struggle of recovery all of it so which is an excellent and uh, not backwards thinking that's the wrong phrase but uh, it's a good retrospective look to, to keep positive about it but it was a difficult process I'm sure sure Take me through a time, maybe if if this even happened, uh, a point in the injury and rebuilding process where you thought, "Man, this is it. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen." That happened all the time, um, but it's still a, a mindset when it was happening. So I would practice. You know, I, there was originally I couldn't, literally couldn't play five minutes in a day. No, no chance. Uh, Thirty seconds maybe. Uh, and so you start from that, and then you try to relearn and unlearn and do everything you've done a whole career. Uh, and every way that you would hit a plateau, you would think, well, that's as good as I'm going to ever recover, or that's as good as I'm going to ever recover. And so all the way up until maybe a year and a half to two years in, I thought, oh, that's where it is. That's where it is. That's where I end. That's where I stop. And I, I've even told people, hey, you know, if you don't like what you're hearing, this is, this is probably as good as it's going to get. Uh, and none of that was said with, like, uh, being self-deprecating, self like, this is just this is what I was able to do, uh, but then it turned out those were just plateaus, and you just keep pushing through. That's awesome. You're my hero, man. That's <laughs> great. You're supposed um, to pick heroes that are dead because they'll never let you down. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, all right. So, did you ever consider an alternate career? Yes. Through that time, uh, mm -hmm. I thought about becoming a systems engineer. Even looked into getting a degree in it. You do some work here at West Point. With I've that, been right? fortunate to be able to help with that department uh, on several projects. So, what does being a systems engineer uh, entail? A lot of it is analysis and then applied to processes. So, you look at the life cycle of a process, which you know, starting off all the way to how it how it regenerates and regenerates and regenerates until it finally stops altogether. We do this as musicians in training constantly. 
but if you apply it to anything else, anything else, any process, you know, whether it's you see people standing in a line at Starbucks, how can you reduce that line, or how can you be more efficient or cost effective, all of that, we do that in our trumpet playing. And so it was very natural. You just had to start picking up the mathematics to go along with it and learning what standard deviations were and what were acceptable. All right, we're starting the monster round, our version of the lightning round. We're going to ask Denver a series of rapid-fire questions. He's going to respond right away. It's bare bones. He's honest. This is Denver Dill with no figurative clothes on. Here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Favorite place to perform? Cemetery. First car? S10 Chevy truck. Fastest time running a mile? 530. Favorite team in any sport? No team sports. I Favorite sport, then? Tennis. Ideal room temperature? 72. Favorite tennis player? Mm, I'm still an Andres, uh, Andre Agassi fan. Boxers or briefs? Oh, what's the uh, hybrid? Boxer briefs? Boxer briefs. Boxer briefs, all right. <laughs> favorite milkshake flavor? Vanilla. Name three of your favorite composers. Ferio, Maxwell Davies, and Wagner. Least favorite orchestral excerpt? Oh, Leonore. <laughs> Beatles or Stones? Neither. <laughs> favorite monster? Sully from Monsters Incorporated. O.J. Simpson or Ray Lewis? Who's the better football player? No clue. O.J. had a heck of a run in a Bronco. <laughs> favorite etude book? Clark. Who would win in a staring contest, you or me? Probably me. Definitely me. Crap. Got it. If you could have achieved the same level of accomplishment playing another instrument, which one? Piano. Cornet, love or hate? Love it. Name a first pet. Pumpkin. Favorite note? A. Favorite key? E flat. Me too. Favorite, uh, sorry, fastest you have ever driven a car? The speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> Saxophone, yes or no? No way. Weakest part of your playing? Uh, double tonguing high E's. <laughs> Favorite number? 13. One superpower? Uh, X-ray vision. First piece of music that made you realize that that's what you wanted to do? Space is a diamond. Best musician joke? Uh, what do you call a million violas at the bottom of the ocean? You got me. A good start. <laughs> Alright, you have a time machine. You can go back to any concert that occurred in history. Which one? Right of Spring uh, premiere, but, you know, away from the crowd. <laughs> All right. You have a Pops concert in 10 minutes. All you have is a natural yeah. trumpet or a Hummel keyed trumpet in E. What do you wear to the concert? A tux, white jacket. If a trumpet falls in the woods, would it still be loud and sharp? Absolutely. Denver, thanks so much for being here today. I had a blast. I learned a ton. We really appreciate your time. Folks at home, don't forget to grab a copy of Denver's book, www.denverdill.com. Denver, thanks so much, man. Nice to meet you, Joe. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. If you'd like to know when our next video comes out, feel free to subscribe by clicking here, or maybe even here.